Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, at one time, Oklahoma was home to more all-black towns than any state in the nation. Today, our focus is on the work underway to revitalize communities established when our society was separate and seldom equal. We look back at a Civil War battle most notable by those who fought it, people of color, and the work underway to preserve that heritage. One of the significance of our Honey Springs Visitor Center is the remarkable number of partners that have brought to the, been brought together to, to put a project on in, in a community that, um, frankly, most of Oklahoma has forgotten about. We take you to the all-black town of Rennesville, Oklahoma, that has a storied past and the current mayor hopes a bright future. I've got to see growth, uh, and, and if it's not happening, I've got to make it happen. We'll introduce you to Selby Minner, who leads the yearly Dust Till Dawn Blues Festival in honor of her late husband and Rennie'sville town native, blues legend, D.C. Minner. Well, I would like to see a hundred festivals. The goal is to keep the music alive. I visit with the executive director of Oklahoma's Historical Society about Oklahoma's historical all-black towns. In fact, the African-American experience is Oklahoma history. And we end our day in Tulsa to learn how something as simple as a haircut can bring a community together. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech, a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, historically, Oklahoma has more all-black towns than any other state in the nation. Cheap land in what then was Indian Territory, combined with the institutionalized racism of the segregated Jim Crow South, led many African Americans to these all-black settlements. It's a history that takes us back more than a century and a half to the middle of the Civil War and the Battle of Honey Springs. It was a rainy day in 1863 when armies from the North and South fought a battle Civil War reenactors still recreate. Every detail from their uniforms to the tactics they use, an accurate representation except one, the color of their faces. Well, the Battle of Honey Springs has been called the Gettysburg of the West because when this fateful day was over, the Confederacy began to lose its grip on this part of the country. But just as importantly as who proved victorious that day are the people who actually spilt their blood here. On that fateful day, soldiers from all five civilized Native American tribes wore both blue and gray. And believe it or not, the same can be said for African Americans. And the story itself is one of diversity. On this battleground, on one day, July 17th, 1863, two armies met. With the majority Native American and African American fighting side by side. Bob Blackburn of the Oklahoma Historical Society says it was here the black troops gained the respect of their commanders. He put them in the middle of the Union lines to take the fiercest part of the battle. They were not fighting just for their families and their homes. They were fighting for their very freedom. And history was decided as the smoke cleared, yet never properly recognized until now, opening a new visitor center in a ribbon cutting decades in the making. Well, if you can't get there, you can't participate in anything that goes on there. It was under former Governor David Walter's administration that infrastructure work began to revitalize this long-forgotten battlefield. Tourism activities like this, this very famous battle at Honey uh, Springs and, the, and this wonderful Jazz Hall of Fame at Rennie'sville and all of that gets benefited when roads and bridges make it convenient and easy to get there. That led to a multi-million dollar public-private partnership. Ryan McMullen is Oklahoma's State Director of Rural Development. 
Well, the significance of our Honey Springs Visitor Center is the remarkable number of partners that have brought to de been brought together to, to put a project on in, in a community that, um, frankly, most of Oklahoma has forgotten about. And to be able to build a state-of-the-art Visitor Center to st tell such a compelling part of Oklahoma history. Thanks in great part to financing provided by the Department of Agriculture. Lisa Mensa is USDA's Undersecretary for Rural Development. I think we do our best work in partnership, and most of the facilities that I lead require partnerships. You know, our biggest, I have a portfolio at Rural Development that's over 200 billion, 100 million, 100 billion of that is in guarantees. So I'm guaranteeing private bank loans to industry, to uh, facilities. And so, my goodness, that is right here in Rennesville. There's a private local bank that is extending credit to, to the Friends of Rennesville to, for this facility. But it's our government guarantee that supports them. Working to ensure that the sacrifices made on this battlefield by soldiers of color will never be forgotten. And just like the Battle of Honey Springs was a turning point for the war in the West, hopes are the opening of the new visitor center will be a turning point for the historic black town of Rennesville that sits right next door. And that's where we pick up our story when we return. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, just a half mile west of the Civil War battlefield of Honey Springs is the small rural town of Rennesville. One of 50 all-black towns in Oklahoma settled between 1865 and 1920. But today, Rennesville is one of just 13 that still survives, thanks to the townspeople who live there. Rennesville has been here since 1903. At one point in Rennesville, there were several mercantile stores. It was a cotton gin. Uh, carnivals came to Rennesville. The population was really large here. When the Depression came, the family couldn't survive here and they just moved away. And that just left uh, businesses crumbling, uh, people leaving, and, and it just almost folded the community. I'm Mildred Burkhalter, and I'm mayor of Rentisville, Oklahoma. I took a survey of what it would take to keep Rentisville alive because it was slowly, the curtain was coming down on it, it was drying up. I had to come up with a plan. I came up with the fact that we needed a community building, something that would draw the community together. We once had all uh, dirt roads, now we have paved, paved roads or paved streets or whatever. Uh, the streets have names. The park was developed to something for the children, so it keeps a little bit of life in the center of Rennesville. The sign up on the highway says 66, but we're at about 132 people since that last uh, census poll was taken. Noted American historian John Hope Franklin was born in Rennesville in 1915. Considered the country's preeminent black historian, Franklin is best known for his work from slavery to freedom. And it is the history that surrounds Rennesville that could well determine its future. You can have 100,000 people traveling that road but not one dollar of that money is going to stop in Rennesville unless you have something to offer to the people. But as the sun sets on this little town each evening, a musical revival often awakes at the Oklahoma Blues Hall of Fame. There's nothing like expressing yourself in the blues art form that allows you to tell your story or perform the music behind someone who has a story to tell. I'm Selby Minner. I live here in Rennesville and run the Oklahoma Blues Hall of Fame, which is 
what this is in the old juke joint that was founded by D.C. Minner's grandmother in 36. I'm originally from Rhode Island. The music is what got me here in D.C. Minner. He was born on this spot. I met him in California and he moved me back here. A beautiful dream, a dream for two. When you find the right one, who makes your dream of love come true. Everybody in Randysville thought nobody ever came down here because they went to bed at 10 and we opened, our people showed up at 11 and then our people left at 5 a.m. and they all got up at 6 and D.C. would get out there and clean up all the beer cans before they drove by on the way to church. So everybody that lived in town thought he was like Noah building the ark, trying to make this place 75 feet by 75 feet, and they had only seen two cars here at any one time. Music brings people together, and I've seen that over and over and over again. Chuck Berry, back when he was out there, they had that little yellow line and the white people dancing on one side and the black men is illegal and the next thing you know, second song, that little yellow line's gone and everybody's dancing. And that's a lot of what changed this country back in the 60s. A little thing called the gorilla song. Now I want everybody to get into this one. A little thing me and Bronco wrote together. Well, the video we just showed you is from the website Struggle and Hope. Carrie Barber is its creator and the producer of an upcoming documentary on Oklahoma's historic black towns. So Carrie, we're all here jamming in the studio to the blues. That had to be a lot of fun to shoot. It was so much fun to shoot and I really recommend anybody who's interested attend the Blues Festival every Labor Day in Rentiesville. It is such a good time, but they have all kinds of things going on at the Down Home Blues Club throughout the year. And music was such an important part of this story that it almost became a character in itself in the film. So Carrie, while these towns may face similar challenges, do they also have their own identities? Um, each town is really unique and so that's why I think um, I really enjoyed doing the web videos where we got to focus and tell a story about each of the towns and that's why I think it's really important and interesting to try to visit more than one of the towns. You can learn a bit about music in one place and maybe learn about something else somewhere else but there's just so many stories to be told in each of these towns. So Carrie at the end of the day what do you want to accomplish with the Struggle and Hope website and then the documentary? I hope that people everywhere across the U.S. will look around themselves, look around their own towns, and notice the history that maybe is not being told. Um, for so long, history was what I guess some people call a top-down history. Um, and a lot of stories were left out because of that and maybe never even recorded. So I think that that's really what this film and this project is about, is creating a more robust history that includes more voices and more diverse accounts of history that really becomes a more truthful history about our shared, um, our shared story. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie. And Thank we you. certainly look forward to visiting with you when the documentary does come out. Now, you can see more videos of Oklahoma's historic all black towns at struggleandhope.com. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, a cut above in community relations. But first, Oklahoma's black history. And white people could not go on the same coach railroad car, they could not live in the same communities. Well, Oklahoma's African-American journey is tightly woven into the historical fabric of our state. Even before the Civil War, African-Americans called what was then Indian Territory home. Some as slaves, but others as freedmen. At the ribbon cutting for the new Honey Springs Battlefield Visitor Center, I was able to visit with the executive director of the Oklahoma Historical Society, Bob Blackburn. Well, Dr. Blackburn, we're here at Honey Springs Battlefield Park, the new opening of this facility, and it really highlights the importance of our black towns are here in Oklahoma and how they really preceded statehood. They did. In fact, the African-American experience is Oklahoma history. It's a part of it. From the very beginning, it's been part of our history. When the five civilized tribes were removed to the Indian Territory, they brought with them their African-American slaves. And so we had slavery here. We had one Choctaw who owned 500 slaves, had several plantations, two river boats, plying the Red River. Rich Jovan, a Cherokee planter, had slaves. So slavery was a part of our foundation story. Mm -hmm. The difference comes is that after the Civil War, 
when most of the tribes sided with the Confederacy, they were punished. And whereas Congress coming out of the war promised African-American, now freedmen, that we will help you with 40 acres and a mule, we'll help you become good Americans, they did not keep that promise anywhere except in Oklahoma. And they forced the five tribes to treat their former slaves and their children and grandchildren as members of the tribe in terms of land. And so fast forward through the allotment process from 1898 to 1902, and each of the tribes gave a piece of land to their former slaves, their children and grandchildren. And as those people take their farms, most were farmers, then they settled in fresh land and in good watered river valleys. And you put 30 or 40 good farms together creating wealth, then you can attract a blacksmith, you can attract a school, an attorney, a newspaper, and you have a growth of town. Well, we had over 35 all black towns that popped out of this historical connection of the former slaves, congressional policy, tribal history, towns like Rentiesville and Bowley and Clearview and Summit, and they go on. Well, those towns prosper because they get their land just as the golden age of American farming is starting in 19, 1898 going to 1918. And as farmers are doing well, they're doing well. Bowley gets up to 5,000 people and it's hosting a big rodeo and people are coming here. George Washington Carver comes in. National leaders are recognizing what's going on in these towns. Well, the decline begins as agriculture starts to suffer in the 1920s and 30s. The all black towns start to lose their population. The Dust Bowl migration that people identify with, with the western part of the state and John Steinbeck. Well, people from these all black towns who couldn't make a living anymore left and would go to Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Wichita, California. So what then was the role of the Jim Crow laws? The first Senate bill filed in 1907, we became a state, was a Jim Crow bill. It was to separate the races, to separate a community based on the pigment of your skin, nothing else. Segregation was a cancer on our society, dividing us, fear, hatred, misunderstanding, lack of opportunity. Fast forward to the 1940s, the effect of the Great Depression, the New Deal programs, World War II. Finally, the black community says, we've got to pull a brick out of the wall of segregation. A young girl in Chickasha named Ola, Ada Lois Sipiel, later Fisher, says, I will enroll at the University of Oklahoma School of Law. Oklahoma courts say, no, you can't do it, it's against the law, it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court with the help of a young attorney named Thurgood Marshall, and they win. For the first time since 1896, the law of the land is that separate but equal is not constitutional. So that one brick is taken out, opens the gates to another case in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka that desegregates public schools. Then you throw in the sit-ins of the 1960s and people like Claire Looper in Oklahoma City. And we're, start, we're starting to break down the walls that have been created between us. The walls are still there. They may not be as tall, they may not be as solid, but you can see in race relations, we still have a long way to go. And we're dealing with this shared memory of segregation, of slavery, of lack of justice and equal opportunity. We have to be aware of the impact of the five tribes in slavery, of the all black towns, of segregation. And yet despite all this, these black towns, at least 13 of them still survive. And we're working with them. Dr. John Hope Franklin, who was born in Rennesville, became one of America's greatest historians of all time, wrote the book, From Slavery to Freedom, was helping us in the 1990s recognize the all black towns, do an interpretation. We still have conferences, tours of the all black towns. We need to celebrate that story and do what we can to help the people who still live there. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the impact that just one person can make on society, I'd like to invite you to join us again next week when we examine the connection between education and the struggle for our civil rights. He always wanted you to be equipped. No matter what, he wanted you to be equipped with something. Something you'll be able to do to be successful in life. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, the start of a new school year can put the squeeze on even the biggest of home budgets. With uniforms and school supplies required for back to school, some families have trouble affording it all. But a yearly event at Tulsa Tech seeks to make things a little bit easier.
Blaine Singletary has a story about how a simple haircut can build connections. With trimmers, combs, and a cadre of hairdressers and barbers, this may look like a ritzy, expensive hair salon, but today... Today we are hosting a back-to-school barber cutoff at Tulsa Technology Center. That's Chuck Jones, barber instructor at Tulsa Tech's Peoria campus, and he's brought barber students and professionals from around the area to get local kids looking sharp for the new school year free of charge. My students, out of the goodness of their heart, decided that they want to be here, they want to be present, and take advantage of this great learning opportunity, but even more so to just be able to give something special like a haircut to a student. The professionals also, uh, this is their day off, Sunday. They probably worked all day yesterday, but now they're here devoting their time. This annual event started in 1995 and has grown and grown ever since. Today, this team of 30 barbers has served around 200 kids, some of whom have never seen a barber before. Yeah, the kids are nervous. We love to just kind of settle them down, uh, let them know that they're going to get the haircut they wanted. And so as the barbers are cutting their hair, they're also giving them instruction on how to maintain that look. And that's keeping it clean, first of all, and then how to groom it. I think this is going to be a, a pretty good event for not just them, but us as well, to get to know the community even more. And that's one of the main draws of this event. Through the simple act of giving a haircut, these Tulsa Tech students and administrators are building bridges with the community. Randy Craven is the campus director and says events like these can only benefit their mission at Tulsa Tech. Uh, it's an opportunity to help prepare students for a great year moving forward. It's also a great opportunity for us, uh, Tulsa Tech, to partner with our industry colleagues uh, to do a great work in the Tulsa area. While kids are waiting to get their haircuts, other local businesses and organizations have filled the campus halls to set these kids up with school supplies and other things to get them off on the right foot. And for parents like Amanda Hernandez, this can be a huge help. I have five children. Their hair grows so quick that, you know, trying to get their haircuts is sometimes a challenge. With this community, it's really important. We have, you know, just so many people that, you know, that they might not be able to afford to, you know, especially with uniforms and supplies and everything else, especially at this time of the year. It's really important. It helps a lot. It also helps the student barbers, as this day simulates an average busy day at the salon. Cosmetology instructor Aubrey Brunger from Tulsa Tech's Broken Arrow campus says it's even helped her learn a thing or two today. It is extremely important. Um, there's only so much you can do on a mannequin, but getting a steady flow of real humans to learn how to cut different hair types, different lengths, different wave patterns, it's extremely important. And let's not forget the benefits that the kids themselves get from this. State Representative Regina Goodwin stopped by, and she tells us a good haircut can help a school kid far beyond their appearance. For one, uh, you know, if you look good, you feel good. And when you have that and you're going into your first day of school, then you're going to be prepared, and we're going to be getting some good grades, and we're going to be representing the best that we can be. But if there's one word that really sums up what these kids are getting out of this, it's confidence. They sit down in the chair, looking in a certain way. When they get out of the chair, you see the confidence, you see the smiles. They know they're ready, they're gonna be prepared for tomorrow, and they're gonna be getting off to a great start. It's a word we kept hearing many times on this eve before the school year, and one that Chuck Jones says gets to the heart of what this day is all about. I think haircuts, styles, I'll just say your image is pretty big. These kids are coming in and they're getting a little bit more confidence today. A kid who is confident about his or herself, maybe they'll perform a little bit better in class. Maybe they'll pay attention a little bit more. Maybe they'll feel better about themselves when they're taking a test or doing their work or homework. Because they feel good about themselves, we just think we'll set them up for a successful school season just kind of starting them off on the right track. Now Tulsa Tech offers low-cost hair appointments throughout the week. For more information, just head to okhorizon.com where we have everything you need.
Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Having the right skills is vital to finding a good job. For some, though, that hasn't always been enough. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the work of generations past and their legacy today. It was the first time that black students and white students sat in a classroom since statehood. Achieving the American Dream on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry.